Welcome. This is Alan Mindenhall, publisher and editor in chief of Southern Literary Review. My guest today is Keith Dollar. Keith is the author of Old Country Fiddle, published by Red Dirt Press. Here's what it looks like right here. And also of Wayland County, Texas Stories, published by Sleeping Panther Press. He's won the Texas Observer Short Story Contest and the Gary Wilson Short Fiction Award. He's been named a finalist for the Kay Catarella Award for Best Short Story by the Texas Institute of Letters and twice been recognized as a semifinalist for the American Shorter Fiction Prize. His writing will be included in the forthcoming anthology, A Fire to Light Our Tongues, which is published by TCU Press, Texas Christian University Press. And he lives in Fort Worth, where he is uh, calling in today. Good morning, Heath. How are you? Doing well. Thank you kindly for having me this morning, Alan. Well, it's great to have you here. I'm excited to talk about Old Country Fiddle. And uh, I want to start by asking you just about the short story form. What drew you to the short story form? Obviously, uh, the genre is uh, more succinct than, say, a novel, of course, where you have to fit plot and narrative within a space that can be read in one sitting. What drew you to that particular uh, genre? I, I love the short story and the fact that, and for, for those very reasons, a reader can a reader can sit down and read a story in a handful of minutes. And I know a lot of folks, you know, work all day and then they come home and they want to read. Sometimes they'll read the same chapter from a novel 20 times before they finally move on to the next one because they forgot it from the night before. With with the short story form, you know, you can you can a reader can sit down, read a story and they see the beginning, they see the middle, and they see the end, and they they see that the conclusion, and by and then they've read the story and, and seen a piece of literature in 15 minutes before they went to sleep. Yeah, I wonder if in the age of TikTok and Twitter and social media, where information is given in bite-sized forms and attention spans seem to have diminished, whether the short story will have a new life where it will be revitalized will it become more popular again because people seem to be strapped for time and maybe the short story is just easier to read than an entire novel i think i think that very well could be the future well i hope it is i i you know the short story enjoys a long and prestigious career in particular in american letters and uh, i like to think that you've added your own contribution to that tradition so tell me a little bit about how you discovered Red Dirt Press and how you came to uh, publish with Red Dirt Press. Well, you know, I'd had a story come out that was called Old Country. I had a story come out that was called um, The Flag Salesman. And The Flag Salesman came out with Cowboy Jamboree. And uh, Amy Wilson from Red Dirt happened across the story and, um, and got in contact with me. And um, I had a couple of stories published through Cowboy Jamboree. I really enjoyed the dealing with the nice people from the press and I decided that was a great place for my for my collection to come out provided they would have it is that Adam Van Winkle's publication Cowboy Jamboree that is that's Adam's, that's Adam's that's publication awesome. well this is this is an annoying question everyone hates being asked this but what is your favorite story in the collection do you have a favorite story in the collection that is a wonderful question um you know, I think about when it comes to what's your favorite story, and it, I think a lot of times as a writer, I think sometimes it was which one was hardest for you to write, and you felt like you pulled it off. You know, that's sometimes the way I feel about it. There are stories. I mean, there are stories I have a, I, I have a deep connection with. I, you know, I think I like Ink Upon the Furrows. That's one of the stories I like. I, I, um, I like, for example, Psychobilly Prayer, which is sort of a, it's, it's a departure from the other stories in the book, but I found it was, I found it to be a, a fun story to write and looking from a vantage point I don't normally look from. Maybe I've enjoyed the story more along the lines because it was a departure from, from other stories, although it was still tied to the, to the collection, you know, but right. I think, you know, that's just, but I, I, what I found is interesting. Different readers definitely like different stories. I've, I don't think I've heard the same re heard heard the same favorite story from any particular reader. Uh, you hear several readers; they all have seem to have a different opinion of which one um, I guess resonated with them. Well, what ties the stories together, or what links them, is 
the Texas Hill Country area, either the characters or the places that that uh, in which the stories take take place. Um, I guess, do you consider yourself a, a Texas author? Is that is that part of your identity as a writer? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I'm born and raised in Texas. I mean, my family worked in the forest stockyards. Um, you know, worked in the packing houses and such. My family's been here for, you know, for generations. I've, I've definitely considered myself a Texas writer. I was, you know, my, I remember being a little boy. My grandfather was singing the old Chisholm Trail to me to put me to sleep. You know? <laughs> yeah, I de de Texas is definitely in my blood. Well, and how did you choose the order in which the stories appeared? Was that random or I assume it had to have been deliberate? Oh, the order was extremely deliberate. Um, as far as the story goes, I, I decided I'd start with a story um, that what I felt was a good entrance, and I and it, there was a gradual build. I I felt it was I like the idea of of keeping stories that I feel are I feel strong stories at certain points within. And I really kind of consider it a bit like putting together a record. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, was, I guess that's the way I, I looked at it. It was, I guess I, I looked at it the way you're going to put together an album. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. Well, I want to read a little bit from one of the stories. And the reason I've chosen this particular story is that I am a golfer. And as you and I sit here talking right now, we are only hours after the conclusion of the PGA Championship, which was yesterday. So we're, we're talking here on Monday, May 23rd. But I want to read uh, just a little bit from uh, the story, The Lost Mind of El Noveno Hoyo. Um, and I, don't, I, won't give you, I won't give any spoilers, but I just want to read some pieces of it. The land was likely cursed, and this is referring to the, uh, the, the local golf course. Andrew summarized, considering that a bevy of priests had been massacred on what was now the golf course, and at least one 18th century skirmish between angry Apaches and occupying Spanish troops had transpired in the general vicinity. The ghosts of the Lippin elders and the Spanish soldiers surely were exacting their revenge in the form of triple bogeys and botched mulligans. No player in the history of the Wayland County Municipal Nine-Hole Golf Course had ever reached par. In fact, 20 strokes over seemed to be par for the course. The land was also infested with Western diamondback rattlesnakes, causing many golfers to break from traditional sartorial norms and wear chaps, jeans, and high-shafted cowboy boots instead of the polyester pants and studded saddle shoes. Andrew thought the incredible rattlesnake presence could also be the work of the spirits, but then it was probably the result of the rattlesnakes hunting the mice that dined upon the spilled popcorn from the little tubs by the sexy church girl who worked in the concession stand outside the clubhouse. Clubhouse, Andrew thought was a funny word in this case, considering that the clubhouse was a single wide trailer with rowdy, rowdy, boisterous varmints living under the floor. But Andrew paid the clubhouse little attention for he didn't think the coffer would be found beneath it anyway. The ground was too flat. Upon deciding that it was time to leave, Andrew changed into his slate gray colonial parchment books golf shirt, put on a pair of heavily starched jeans and tall tooled cowboy boots made in his parents' workshop and went to the garage. He found his golf clubs, which he had not used in months, and put them into the back of his truck. He then verified the addresses of the packages of rare books he was sending to the museum in Arizona and placed them on the bench seat beside him and headed toward the post office. I'll stop there. There's so much more I wanted to read from this story, but I'll ask, first of all, sort of the improbable question, which is, are you a golfer? I am not a golfer. I'm not a golfer. You have a lot of really good golf details in there for someone who doesn't play golf. I, I was a, I was I golfed in my youth, but I don't think I've I don't think I've I've been on a course in I, I would say probably twenty years. <laughs> well, what I like about that little passage is that it it shows in a small way how you are able to cultivate character traits and and just um, brief passages how you're able to develop uh, characters and uh, reveal much about who they are, where they come from, even when you're not describing them and you're describing their surroundings, you're able to uh, bring to light different qualities and characteristics that these uh, figures possess. So yeah. I guess if there's a question there, Heath, if there's a question there, it's 
how how do you work on character development? I mean, what what tactics do you use as an author before you come to the story? Do you have the character uh, in mind already, and you're trying to uh, figure out how to fit that person into the narrative? What what do you do with your character development? Most of the time, the character comes first. Most of the um, most of the what I write, I'm. I'm more interested in the character than the action in most stories. I mean, that really is the way I'll look at it. I, I read a lot of history or if I'm, if there's a story I want to tell um, with like with this particular character, you know, I like to delve in the history of my characters. I like, I think um, the present is incredibly informed by the past. And so that's, and that's the way I look at things. Um, I like to sort of inhabit the character. And once I've developed a mindset, I just try my best to write from that mindset. And I like to, I write in deep third. I don't, I don't, I very rarely write in first, but I write in deep third, I write in third person. And I do my best to color my language in a way that it, that it match, matches the character's consciousness. And when did you start writing Heath? Oh gosh, I've written most of my life. Um, I wrote my the first thing I thought was a novel when I was probably 18, 19 years old. I've been been at this for, you know, over 30 years. Oh, you just revealed your age. You shouldn't have done that. Oh no. <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, um, it's been it's been great to talk to you. As you know, these uh, Southern Literary Review. Uh, interviews are are pretty quick, but I want to end with one final question because we have so many uh, readers and viewers of our interviews who are aspiring authors. I, I think, I know, and there's no way for me to demonstrate this empirically, but I think we have more readers and viewers who are aspiring authors than most magazines or journals do. And I'm wondering if you have advice for those people who would like to write their first short story collection or who would like to write their first novel. I hear from these people all the time. They email all the time seeking advice. And of course, we don't have the capacity to just sit here giving, um, you know, that's that sort of dispensing that sort of advice to, to everybody who emails. So uh, I like to ask our writers, the people we're interviewing that question so that I can point these readers and viewers to those interviews and say, hey, you know, why don't you see what this person said? So what would you say? I would say it requires dedication. I think dedication is critical. I, determination, I believe, taking criticism and using it to improve your work, uh, never ever giving up, I think. I mean, this book, um, Old Country Fiddle, it's, uh, it came out and, and um, in March, I learned that it won the Texas Institute of Letters um, Jesse H. Jones Award for Best Book of Fiction. Um, just years and years of hard work and culminated into an award I never thought I would win. I just think as a writer, you just don't give up, work hard. Um, learn to look at your work as a product and look at it objectively. And then I think that's the path. I think that's the path to publication and the path to victory. I love it, Heath. Thank you very much. And again, the book is Old Country Fiddle by Heath Dollar. It's a collection of short stories published by Red Dirt Press. Highly recommend it. You can buy it anywhere books are sold, amazon.com. You can go to the Red Dirt Press website and find it there. And Heath, you want to end by giving us um, another way people can find your work or find out more about you? Um, I would suggest going to the Red Dirt Press website. Um, as well as heathdollar.com um, and see what's happening. Um, but th thank you very much for having me, Alan. I greatly appreciate it. Well, it's been my pleasure, Heath, and we'll have to do it again sometime when you publish your next one. Sounds like when the next one's going to be a novel. All right. Well, good. We'll, we'll do it again then. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Heath.